Good evening, everybody. Lovely to see each one of you here this evening. We do give you a very warm welcome. David has already announced my subject, Isaiah, the prophet of the golden age. If you have your Bibles with you, you might turn with me to Isaiah chapter 24. It's a lengthy chapter, so we won't read it all, but we read enough of it to get the gist of what Isaiah is saying. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken his word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the world languisheth and fadeth away, the haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore has the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. We'll pass down to verse 17. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the hosts of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and they shall be shut up in the prison. And after many days, they shall be visited. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. I'm sure the Lord will add his blessing to that reading of his precious word. Isaiah, the prophet of the golden age. I love the prophecy of Isaiah. It's a, it, it's a wonderful book. It has so much in it uh, and so much that we can learn if we have an interest and a desire for prophetic truth. I think there are three main themes in Isaiah's prophecy. The first theme is the theme of the sovereignty of God. We have that in chapter six, that very famous vision that Isaiah had. In the year that King Uzziah died, he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. We're introduced there to the theme of, of the sovereignty of God. The second great theme in Isaiah is the theme of the suffering servant. And again, we have a great chapter that uh, portrays this, chapter 53 which we're all very familiar with, where we read of he who was smitten, smitten of God and afflicted, he who carried our sins and bore our sorrows. Of course, the suffering servant was not the nation of Israel, but the suffering servant is the person of Jesus Christ. The third great theme in Isaiah is the one that we're looking at tonight. It's the theme 
of the golden age. When I say the golden age, I'm referring to the millennial reign of Christ on earth. I'm referring to that time when the Lord Jesus Christ will return again and when he will establish his kingdom and he will rule, as the scripture says, for a thousand years upon this earth. It will be a golden age. And what a, what a glorious age it will be, something to, to rejoice in and to look forward to, for we shall have our part in some measure and in some way in that golden age. Before we look at what Isaiah says about the golden age, let's just say a little bit about the man himself. Isaiah, we are told in chapter 1, verse 1, is the son of Amos. We read further on that he is married to a prophetess. So he's in a good spiritual relationship. We believe that he was a man of uh, royal blood. There's evidence to suggest that he is related to the royal house of Judah. And Isaiah will have spent his early years in the court of King Uzziah as, um, as an official in, in Uzziah's court. It wasn't until the year 740 BC, the year in which King Uzziah died, that Isaiah got his call to ministry. That was when the Lord called him out as a prophet. You remember the response in Isaiah chapter 6, here am I, Lord, send me. And that was the beginning of a long and glorious tenure of prophecy. Isaiah died probably around about 681 BC. So he would have prophesied for nearly 80 years, 79 years, in, in fact. And uh, it was a, a glorious time of prophecy. But he, he, he suffered a cruel death, according to Jewish tradition, under the reign of Manasseh, who was one of the evil kings, uh, probably the most evil king who ever reigned on the throne of Judah. And we are told that Isaiah uh, was sawn in half. What a terrible and cruel way to, to kill a man. Uh, and, and what a, a, a tragic end to a man who had given his life and given so much for the nation and for the people of the nation. So that's what we know about Isaiah. Again, let's just say a word about the foundation of his message and this theme of the golden age. Isaiah is the one who more than any other prophet gives us a picture and a description of what the millennial reign of Christ will look like. Of course, he wasn't the only one. I want to just take you back to, to the New Testament before we look into Isaiah and into the book of Acts. Firstly, in Acts chapter 1. In the Gospels, we read of how both Jesus and uh, John the Baptist preached the coming of the kingdom. Then, of course, Jesus was rejected and crucified, rose again. And then in Acts chapter 1, he's in conversation with his disciples, and they still haven't understood fully what is happening, uh, for they raise the question with him in, in Acts chapter 1 and in verse 6. And the question is this, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? In other words, they said to him, is this the time when you're going to reign on earth? Is this when the prophecies are going to be fulfilled? Are you going to establish your kingdom now? Of course, Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that my father has in his own knowledge. And at that point, he was uh, taken up into heaven. He ascended into heaven. And the disciples realized then that 
this was not going to be the time for the establishment of the kingdom. And I think they began to realize then uh, exactly what was happening and the whole prophetic truth began to dawn on them because it wasn't very long after we, when we come to Acts chapter 3 that we find that Peter is giving an explanation uh, concerning these things. In Acts 3 and verse 19, he says, Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus, which was, which before you was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive. They're looking back at the ascension now. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things. There we have one of those famous untils. Until the restitution of all things. That is to say, until the time when the kingdom must be established, which God has spoken of by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. And in verse 24, he says, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these things. So what Peter is saying is right from, from Samuel right down through to, to John the Baptist, all the prophets of the Old Testament age, they've all spoken about this. They've all talked about the millennial reign of Christ. They've all referred to this golden age to come. They're all united in this great theme. But as I said a few moments ago, among them all, it is Isaiah who gives us the clearest picture, the most comprehensive uh, picture of the reign of Christ and the golden age to come. So if we go back to Isaiah 24 and to the passage that we read a few moments ago, now you may say to me, I didn't see much of the golden age in that passage. Well, indeed, you didn't, because most of it is taken up with judgment. In fact, the first 22 verses speak about the outpouring of God's wrath and God's judgment upon a Christ-rejecting world. Many believe Isaiah 24 to be a picture of the Great Tribulation. Uh, and indeed, uh, what is contained here in Isaiah's prophecy parallels very clearly with what we read in the book of Revelation concerning the great tribulation period. But Isaiah concludes with this one verse, verse 23, in which he says, When the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. His ancients being the, the elders of Israel. So what Isaiah is saying is that there's going to be a time of judgment upon this world. Judgment such as the world has never known before. He talks about the shaking of the earth. He uses uh, the, the description in verse 13, which we didn't read, but I'll read, read it now. Um, thus shall it be in the midst of the land among the people. There shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the gleaning grapes when the vintage is done. The judgment of God is going to, to shake the foundations of the earth. And that judgment refers to the, to the great tribulation period. Now, what Isaiah is saying is at the end of this judgment, as, as he says in verse 23, the Lord Jesus Christ will return. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming again. And when God has finished with the judgment of the tribulation, then the glorious reign of Christ, the golden age, will begin. He will reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his ancients gloriously. 
I love that word gloriously because there's something very special, something very wonderful about the reign of Christ. It will, it will transform this world. It will change this world beyond recognition. And Isaiah, throughout his prophecy, gives us glimpses of the changes which are to come. Before we look at those changes, there's just one verse, which I think is a key verse in all of this, that I want you to look at. And you'll find it in Isaiah chapter 9. You know it very well, actually. We'll be probably quoting it in a few weeks' time at, at Christmas, as we do every Christmas time. But Isaiah 9 and verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. If you believe in the millennial reign of Christ, and I hope you do, I hope that's why you're, you're with us tonight, then you really need to have these two verses, Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, marked in your Bible. Because Isaiah is introducing this whole subject to us. He says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's the first coming of Jesus Christ. And then he immediately goes on to say, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Well, it didn't happen at the first coming of Christ. The, the rest of what Isaiah says there. Uh, in, the, in the following words of the, that verse and the verse after it, will happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. You see, there is a parenthetical period called the church age between the first and the second coming of Christ. Isaiah doesn't see that. Uh, Isaiah doesn't see the church age. He, he, he immediately goes on to speak about the birth of Christ and his becoming the ruler of the world. The government shall be upon his shoulder. But we do understand uh, something that Isaiah didn't see, that there is this par parenthetical period in which God is calling out a people for himself, uh, a period of grace, a dispensation of, of grace and salvation in which we are living today. But when Jesus comes back, then the government shall be upon his shoulders. And Isaiah says that he will, he will sit on the throne of David, establishing his kingdom, ordering it with justice and with judgment. It's going to be a golden age, unlike anything the world has seen or known before. So then let's let's take a look at a little deeper what Isaiah says about this golden age. And we will see that Isaiah speaks of this golden age as a time of great change. In the first instance, the golden age will bring about political change. Bring about political change. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 4. Isaiah 2 and verse 4, and it reads like this. And he shall judge among the nations, and he shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not rise against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. My, 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 what a change. This world is going to change beyond recognition. This world is, be, is going to become a world of peace. Something that the world has not 
ever known before. Oh, there's been plenty of talk of peace. There's been plenty of effort to try and bring about peace, but it just never happens, does it? Because man is a fallen creature and man is a warlike creature. Ever since the day when Cain lifted his hand in anger against his brother Abel, man has been a warlike creature. And peace always seems to elude us, no matter how hard we try to establish it. But what Isaiah is saying here is there's going to be a change. When Jesus comes back, there will be real peace in the world. There will be a time of great peace such as the world has never known before. And these words, they will be, beat their spears into pruning hooks and so on. These words are actually written on the United Nations building in, in New York. The United Nations was established in order to try and bring peace to this world. What a failure. What a failure the United Nations has been. Throughout its existence, it's never been able to fulfill the motto written on its building. Only Jesus Christ will fulfill that motto. Isaiah wrote it not in relation to the United Nations, but Isaiah wrote it in relation to the reign of Christ. And the United Nations will always fail. We've been reminded a lot about war during this year. With the conflict in the Ukraine, we've seen all the devastation and the bloodshed, the suffering and the death that has taken place there in Ukraine. We've heard all the rantings of Vladimir Putin, even the threats to use nuclear weapons and to resort to that if his back is against the wall. Now, I've followed the news on all of these things. And unless I've missed something, I think the United Nations has been very silent throughout the Ukraine conflict. I, I don't seem to remember the United Nations saying very much. I certainly don't remember them hosting any kind of um, uh, uh, peace event to try and bring Putin and Ukrainians together. You see, the United Nations is a failure because it's a man-made institution. I'm long enough in the tooth to remember the Six-Day War. It, in fact, it had a profound effect upon my life and, and it in some ways led me to faith in Christ. And I remember at the beginning of the Six-Day War, President Nasser said that he was going to drive the Israelis into the sea. But there was a United Nations peacekeeping force between Israel and Egypt. And Nasser said to the United Nations, get out of the way. We're going to drive Israel into the sea. And what did the United Nations peacekeeping force do? They stepped aside. They stepped aside. Such is the failure of that institution. But as Isaiah tells us, there's going to be political change. And the Lord Jesus will establish peace upon the earth. The second great change that Isaiah speaks about is the time of social change, which the golden age will bring about. Society will be different. Socially, and man's um, interactions with man will be different. 
it will be a time when poverty will be a thing of the past. Jesus will bring in a golden age of abundant provision, a time of prosperity across the whole of this earth like has never been known before. We've got familiar with the words like austerity. Uh, and indeed, it seems as if our new chancellor is about to inflict even more austerity upon us. We are living at this present moment in a time of real hardship and difficulty, not just in this country, but in other countries throughout the world as well. We've got familiar with the whole concept of food banks. And how many thousands of people are there in our country? One of the richest nations on the planet, supposedly. How many thousands of people rely on food banks in order to, to continue to, to have a, a meaningful existence? A few years ago, an organization was set up, Churches Against Poverty. You may have seen uh, churches with notice boards uh, outside uh, proclaiming churches against poverty. The idea seemed to resonate very strongly with those churches who believe more in a social gospel than a spiritual gospel. But has the church eradicated poverty? No, it hasn't. And nor will it. Poverty will always be there. Injustice will always be there. As long as fallen man reigns on earth, these things will continue to exist. But when the golden age of the millennial reign of Christ comes, then these things will be banished. Jesus will bring about social change, a change in which people will be prosperous and live in abundance. I want you to turn to Isaiah 65 and verses 21 to 23, if you have your Bibles with you. Isaiah 65, 21 to 23, reads like this. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. This is a picture of prosperity, a, a picture in which all the Weapons of warfare have been melted down, as we saw a moment ago in, in, in chapter 2 and verse 4. Uh, and all the metal has been used to make farming implements, which will enable the world to become more prosperous and abundant than ever it has before. Uh, and these verses in, in Isaiah, Isaiah 65 give us that description. Again, in chapter 30 and verse 23, this is what Isaiah says. Then shall he give the rain of thy seed, that thou shalt sow the ground with all, and bread of the increase of the earth. And it shall be fat and plenteous. In that day shall thy cattle feed in large pastures. So Isaiah is saying, is, is saying not only will mankind benefit from the social change that the reign of Christ will bring about, but even the animal world will benefit from it as well. A great time of social change. Dr. Pentecost, a famous prophecy speaker now with the Lord, once said this. He will establish a perfect economic system in which the needs of mankind are abundantly provided for. I think Dr. Pentecost got that absolutely correct. 
a perfect economic system in which the needs of mankind are abundantly provided for. And the emphasis is on the abundance that will come with that change. Then Isaiah tells us that the golden age will bring about environmental change. Now that's a word that we're familiar with, isn't it? The environment. We hear plenty about that these days, don't we? In fact, it seems to be the, the theme of the day. Certainly, environmental issues have risen to the top of the political agenda in our day and age. All the politicians seem to, to be able to speak about it quite freely. The whole environment of the earth will undergo a fundamental change when Jesus Christ comes. You know, man is trying to change the environment. You've got your Greta Thunbergs. You've got your David Attenboroughs. You've got all these politicians who are promising great things. But, you know, none of them will accomplish what they're trying to achieve. Oh, we hear about carbon footprints. We hear about goals in which nations will try to be carbon neutral by the year 2050. We hear about the new green agenda and so on. Friends, all of these things are just part of man's effort to bring about a one world government, a new world order, which will in time be taken over by, by the Antichrist. But let me tell you, they will not accomplish the environmental change that they espouse. That will only be accomplished when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. He will change the environment beyond recognition. Now, before we look at what Isaiah says about this, let's just turn to a couple of other scriptures. Firstly, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17 says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field, in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and to dust thou wilt return. Here we read of how the environment, the church, the, the, the earth rather, was cursed because of the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Thorns and thistles will it spring up unto you. The earth is under the curse. We go over to the New Testament and we find in um, Romans and chapter 8 and verse 19 that the Apostle Paul had some understanding of the, of the curse which was on the environment. Romans 8 and verse 19, he says, For the earnest expectation of the creature awaits the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, and not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself shall be delivered from bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation, the earthly environment, the whole creation groans and travails together in pain until now. Yes, right from the beginning. Since Adam and Eve sinned, the environment 
has been cursed. But that will change. When the golden age comes, things will be different. Let's look at what Isaiah said about this. Chapter 11 and verses 6 to 9. Talking here about the animal world. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. Imagine that. He's talking here about, about the leopard and the young lion. I have a little dog in my house. When my grandchildren come and visit me, they say to me, Papa, can we take Sam for a walk? And I say, yes, get his lead and you can, you can take him for a walk. And they do, and they love it. Well, in the, in the golden age to come, they won't be taking the pet dog for the walk. They'll be taking the young lion and the leopard. That's what Isaiah tells us. Such will be the change that will take place in the environment. He goes on to say, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play in the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Oh, yes. Those venomous creatures which we fear so much will no longer be like that because a little child will be able to to play with them and not be hurt this is an environmental change such as as we can hardly understand doesn't only affect the animal world but it it it, it affects the, uh, the the flora as well in chapter 55 verse 13 isaiah says Instead of the thorn, you remember we read in, in Genesis 3 that when God cursed the earth, he said thorns and briars will spring up unto you. Well, Isaiah says, instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. You see, the curse will be reversed. The environment will be restored to its former glory as it was before Adam and Eve sinned. Thorns and briars will no longer exist. They will be a thing of the past. So the earth will be restored to its origins. I must move on very quickly. Isaiah tells us that the golden age will be a time of moral change as well. We go back to, to Isaiah 2 uh, and verses 2 and 3. This is what he says. It shall come to pass in those last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Many people shall go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. That's the millennial temple, you see. And he will teach us his ways, he being Christ, and we will walk in his paths. And out of Zion shall go the law, for the word of the Lord will go out from Jerusalem. My, my, what a change that will be. You don't see people hungering and thirsting after righteousness too much in these days, do you? You don't see people clamoring for the word of the Lord and the, and the law of the Lord. No, we live in a very different kind of world. But when Jesus comes again, all of that will be different. People will want to know the truth. They will want to know righteousness. They will want to walk in the path that the Lord marks out. And they will make the effort to go and find out the teaching of the Lord. So there will be a moral change. 
And then there will also be a spiritual change. In Isaiah 11 and verse 9, the latter part of the verse says, For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a wonderful verse that is. Just, just dwell on it for a moment. Just think about what we've just read. The earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Full of the knowledge of the Lord, the whole earth. As the waters cover the sea. That's a spiritual revolution. That's a revival like we've never seen before. In which the Lord's glory will be seen, known, understood, and welcomed by the inhabitants of the millennial earth. Wonderful changes that are going to take place when Jesus Christ comes again. And as we said at the beginning, it's Isaiah who gives us some of the clearest pictures concerning all of these things. And we've really only scratched the surface. There's much more. If you want to go back and read Isaiah for yourself and study it for yourself, you will discover other things that he says there as well. It's a wonderful prophecy. And it speaks of a wonderful future when Jesus Christ reigns on earth, when he is seen to be Lord and King over all. Do you know what the scripture says? The scripture says, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. What does that mean? To suffer with him means, means to be identified with his sufferings. He suffered on the cross for you and for me. He shed his blood for your sins and mine. He took our sins and our sorrows in his own body. He suffered on our behalf. If we identify with that through repentance of our sin and through acceptance of him by faith, if we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. There's a glorious future for those of us who are Christian believers. But just in case there's anybody listening to this, perhaps not tonight, but perhaps on YouTube at a, at a future date, who has not yet received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I want to just utter a word to you tonight. I want to say to you that if you want to be a part of the great future that God has planned through his son, Jesus Christ, then you need to be saved. You need your sins forgiven, for we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need to repent of that sin. I know that's a word that we don't use very much today, but it's thoroughly biblical. You need to repent of your sin. And you need to accept by faith that the blood of Jesus Christ is the only means of salvation. Do that. And you too can share in the golden age that Isaiah speaks so eloquently about. May God bless you and help you so to do. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you tonight for the message of Isaiah, for the words that we have read, and for the glorious truths that are contained in this prophecy. We thank you, Lord, that it speaks of a literal reign of Christ on earth. It speaks of a coming day when you will be honored and glorified upon this planet which you have made. It speaks of a day when we too shall participate in the abundance of your grace and of your mercy extended to the children of men. Lord, grant that each one of us may walk in the light and in the knowledge 
of these glorious truths. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.